Good morning and welcome to Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us today. If you're new, you can text the number on the screen and we'd love to reach out and just say thanks. I'm so excited for what God has in store today. Let's dive in. Well, hey everybody, I'm Paul, next test pastor here at Grace River. I'm so glad you joined us for Church Online from wherever you're watching from. Today, we're in a brand new series called Upside Down Kingdom and we're looking at the most famous sermon ever given. It's a sermon that Jesus gave that we find in the New Testament book of Matthew, Matthew 5 through 7. And over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at this sermon. You know, Jesus gave this message in a cultural moment where the Roman Empire and the Jewish religious leaders were all about power, position, and control. And into that moment, he starts out this message in such a radical, upside-down kind of way. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. In another translation, it says the poor in spirit. Now, it's not talking about financially poor, but those who understand they have a need for him. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not for those who don't think they have any need for him, but for those who know they need a savior. You know, right out of the gate, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus describes an upside-down kingdom that was counter-cultural. And the truth is, it still is. It still is. His ideas flew and fly today in the face of the world that we live in. That's all about power, position, acquisition, upward mobility. And specifically right now, in the cultural moment in which we live, where it's filled with so much angst, so much anxiety about the election, about who our next president will be in this kind of moment. Uh, what he spoke in that Sermon on the Mount confronts us as we face these issues. And so today we're going to be talking about this upside down kingdom. We're going to talk about this cultural moment that we live in and the election that's in front of us just a couple of days away and how we're called to live as Jesus followers. But I also want you to know right away that there's going to be some things that might make you a little uncomfortable, might even make you a little bit mad. And um, I want to encourage you to, to lean in, to, to press in on this. As we talk about the election, as we talk about division, and, and at some point um, I'm either going to not say enough or I'm going to say too much for you. But I, I hope that it will help us evaluate and reevaluate how we're called to live as Jesus followers when we face these cultural moments. Now, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. These are complex issues, and we're seeking God's heart and his kingdom in this. So I'm asking for grace as we walk through this together. You know, we live in a very divided and polarized society, maybe more than ever before, right? We have anger and fear and the news media and our political parties and the left-wing and right-wing organizations, they prey on fear because, you know, nothing divides like politics because nothing divides like fear. You watch CNN and Fox and you see these different news stations. I, whenever I watch cable news, I turn on both of those. I'll watch one for a little bit and one for a little bit after that. And, and, and here's the thing, like you watch those and it's like you're living in two different worlds, right? One says, you know, if Trump becomes president, yada, 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 it's the end of the world as we know it. And then you flip the channel and the other one says, if Harris becomes president, yada, 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 and it's the end of the world as we know it. And it was the same in 2020. It was the same in 2016. We live in a world where fear is currency to get our vote. And isn't it interesting that the most often repeated command in the New Testament of the Bible is do not fear and do not be afraid. Why? Because God is with us and God is still on the throne. God's bigger than any political party, uh, platform, or politician. And empires have risen and fallen through the years, from the, the Roman Empire to the Babylonian Empire, the Nazi Empire to the Communist block and one day the Republican Party and the Democratic Party will fall as well. But God will still be on the throne. His kingdom will still reign forever and ever and ever. You know, no matter who's elected this Tuesday, as followers of Jesus, we do not lose hope because our hope of salvation 
is not found in Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. Our hope for salvation is found in Jesus. This is where our hope lies. Well, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about this upside-down kingdom and the countercultural approach to living the Jesus way. He said things like, don't judge others and love your enemies and don't get revenge, but instead turn the other cheek. And he talked about not just power and position, but instead we're called to surrender and to serve others and to live our life loving enemies. And that sounds like nothing like how our political um, system works, right? Like we're told that if our candidate doesn't get in, the United States is doomed. Now, I'm not saying that we don't take politics seriously, that we don't care about the issues that God cares about, that we don't get involved, we should, that we don't vote, we should. And we're going to talk about that later. But what we need to make clear as well is that we don't want to make the same mistakes that Jesus' early followers made. See, they were anticipating Jesus coming and overthrowing the Roman government, leading a military and political revolution. But that's never been the way of Jesus. and It's never been the way of his church, and it still isn't. Instead, he invites us to live in this upside-down kingdom. So, let's look at the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to start towards the back of the Sermon on the Mount, at least to the middle of it. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 through 20. And this might seem a little odd, but we'll get there. Okay, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store up treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And you might be wondering, why are we talking about treasures? What does that mean? I mean, specifically, this is talking about money and stuff, but it's so much more. And listen, we do this. We get focused on all the things around us, the new toy, the new job, the vacation, the relationship, the election, and, and those things can be oftentimes gone in just a moment, right? A fire, um, an accident, a divorce, and all of a sudden everything is gone and everything's up in the air. And so Jesus tells us that where you store your stuff is really, really important. What's he saying? He's telling telling us, as he was telling them, that in his upside-down kingdom, your focus matters. Your focus matters. As a matter of fact, he says this in the very next verse, verse 21, that where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Like wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to go, in that direction. If all of your uh, treasure and focus is in the stuff that's here on this earth, all your hope is in stuff and money, your own ability, politics, then your heart is going to be too attached to the things of this world and you're going to miss out on the things that God really has for you. But if your focus is on him and this upside down kingdom, you'll store up treasures where it matters. We're to have an eternal focus. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, or 24, it says this, No one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other, You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. But again, it's, it's more than money. It's power, it's control, it's position, it's stuff. It's this kingdom of this world. But in his kingdom, we're his servants. We bow our knee to him. You can't live with full focus on God and full focus on everything of this world. So where are we going to store our treasure. Well, after Jesus talks about that, about uh, where we store our treasure and his provision and we can't serve two masters, he says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. He says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? And he talks about what we eat and what we wear and our provision and his care, and eventually he'll go in and talk about how valuable we are to him. He tells us not to worry or fear, but instead to trust him as our provider and protector because he's a good king. And then it goes on to say this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. He says, no, I want you to seek first my kingdom. 
And if we'll get our focus right, that we can experience the life that he has for us. When we live in Jesus' upside-down kingdom, we have an eternal focus. When we live in his upside-down kingdom, we're called to have an eternal focus. You think about this life, right? Like, we live in this little moment in time. If you've given 50, 60, 80, 90 years, but we have eternity past to eternity future, and we live in this moment. He says, I want your focus to not just be here. I want your focus to be here. I want your focus to be on things that matter for eternity. We seek his kingdom. We put our trust in him, not in our own power, not a political party or a politician. Uh, what does this eternal focus look like when it comes to this election season? Listen, if you're a Jesus follower, you're a Jesus follower first. Not a Republican first, not a Democrat first. I want you to listen to this quote from Michael Byrd, and it will be challenging and convicting for many. He says this, It is far more likely that Jesus, historical man and exalted Lord, does not neatly fit into any side of the political spectrum. The Jew from Nazareth cuts across traditional political lines. No party owns him, as if he, the Lord of the universe, could be owned. Jesus doesn't answer to political super PACs, and he can't be made to utter political endorsements on cue. In other words, Jesus wouldn't be wearing a MAGA hat, nor would he have a Harris Wald's bumper sticker on his car. As one pastor put it, are you willing to put your political filter behind your Jesus filter? Are you willing to follow Jesus even when it puts some separation between you and your party's candidate? And the truth is that many aren't. But this is how we're called to live in this upside-down kingdom of Jesus. Our Jesus filter always comes first. When we live in Jesus' upside-down kingdom, we're called to build our life on Jesus' ways. We're here for just a moment. We've got these 50, 60, 70 years. But on the, on the eternity scale, like it is just a moment in time. But while we live here, we're called to build our life on the ways of Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Way at the back of this greatest sermon ever told, the Sermon on the Mount. It says this. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain came... Uh, comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the homes. It won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. This is the very end of that sermon. He tells people, listen, essentially you can be wise or you can be stupid. Right? You, you can listen to this teaching and actually put it into practice and be wise, like someone building a house on bedrock, or you can be stupid and hear it and not do anything with it. It's like someone building their house on sand. It's just a matter of time before it collapses. We focus so often on the wrong kingdom. And when, when we are foolish... We hear and we do whatever we want. We have an earthly focus. We store treasures here. We hope in the wrong things. We focus on the wrong kingdom. But if you'll live in this upside down kingdom, your life will be built on a solid foundation that won't be swayed. It won't fall apart when the winds and the waves and the storms of life come at you. You won't fall apart when your candidate doesn't win. You won't lose hope when your party isn't in power. The cultural winds won't collapse your life. To live and flourish in this upside-down kingdom of Jesus, we need an eternal focus. We need to build our life on his ways. And we need to understand our true citizenship. Where is our true home? See, that's why Jesus said to store up your treasures in heaven, because we have eternity coming. And when we have our focus right... We're focused on eternity, our true home. As a matter of fact, Paul writes to the church at Philippi about this. And he says with tears in his eyes that so many in our world are thinking only about this little moment in time that we live, but that we're focused on the wrong kingdom. And so he says this to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. 
See, we're citizens of heaven. It's not about position or power. It's, it's not an earthly focus, but an eternal focus. It's a life built on the solid foundation of Jesus as our bedrock, that we're citizens of heaven. We're citizens of his kingdom, not a political kingdom. And our hope doesn't rise and fall on which candidate wins the election. God's not thwarted if Trump wins or if Harris wins. And God isn't relieved if Harris wins or if Trump wins. As if his kingdom somehow was dependent upon who is in the White House. Charles Colson, who was um, a part of the Nixon presidency and part of Watergate, was thrown into prison for his role in it. He had a radical transformation in his life, just kind of like the Apostle Paul did in the New Testament. Charles Colson, he said this. He said, our hope is not in who governs us or what laws are passed or what great things we do as a nation. Our hope is in the power of God working in the hearts of people. It always has been, and it always will be. We can be proud to be Americans. We live in an amazing, amazing country. We have so many freedoms, and we're blessed in so many ways, but we truly only pledge allegiance to one kingdom. And it isn't made up of elephants and donkeys, and it's not nationalistic. And God made that clear with the Jewish people. I mean, Jesus totally disrupted the system of the day. And his radical message of life and hope through his death and resurrection was open to all. Jesus came and brought an upside-down kingdom, and that kingdom will always conflict with the kingdoms of men. It will run contrary to the empires of the past and the empires of the future. And he disrupted his world with this upside-down kingdom. Now, the reality is that we live in the here and now, though. And in many respects, we have like a dual citizenship, right? Our, 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 our citizenship is in heaven, but we also live here in the United States of America. And so what do we do? Well, when it comes to this Tuesday, we should vote. We have this incredible pr privilege. We should, we should vote. We pray, we vote. And how do we vote? We vote our Jesus-centered biblically informed conscience as citizens of heaven. We build our life on Jesus' ways, and so we evaluate policies and politicians and parties on the teachings and the ways of Jesus, and then we vote our Jesus-centered, biblically informed conscience. And the, the truth is, no politician is ever going to be perfect. We've never had one before. We won't ever have one in the future. And again, Jesus isn't wearing a red hat or a blue hat. So we vote, we vote, we do our part, our Jesus-centered, biblically informed conscience. Now, there's one other thing that I want to talk about. It is so important, especially on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, going forward. One other aspect to this upside-down kingdom of Jesus that we see in the New Testament of the Bible in John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. Jesus is with his disciples. It's right before he's arrested. It, Judas has already left the table, so there's not 12 disciples anymore. There's 11. And Jesus, with these guys who've been with him through three years, through all the thick and thin, he tells them this in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. In the New in the New International Version, it says, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Like, how will the world know that we're followers of Jesus? How will they come to know Jesus themselves? By our love. By our love. Not by power or policies or, pos or position or politicians, but by our love. And how are we to love? We're to love like Jesus loved. Even when he didn't agree, he loved. He spoke the truth, and he spoke it in love. He lived with grace, and he made bold proclamations, and yet he loved unconditionally and ultimately even sacrificially. He says, this is how we're to live, and by this, everyone will know that we are his followers. Jesus lived in a world of haves and have-nots, of those who were in power and those who were subservient, 
Jesus comes and brings a whole new world order in this new upside-down kingdom. No more slave or free, male or female, no matter what nationality or background or political leaning, that you could have a place at the table, that you could have a relationship and connection with him, that you could be part of his kingdom if you'll bow your knee to his kingship. This was so countercultural. In a world of very distinct lines, Jesus came and he blows the whole thing up. And those who were on the outside were invited in. And those who had no place found a place. And it wasn't because of military might and some kind of overthrow of the government. And it wasn't because they gained some kind of political power or a seat at the table in the public square with this kind of ideology. It's because they realized that his kingdom was where real hope and life was found. And that realization changed everything. These new Christians, they look so different than the Roman Empire that surrounded them. Their love and their unity caught fire, and it was like a forest fire spreading. And it's still how the movement spreads. In those early days in Rome, the Christians were facing all sorts of persecution, and the Romans were going through their own challenging time. They were facing a major pandemic, and the Roman doctors, with all the sick people around them, fled for the hills. But who didn't flee? The Christians. They stayed. They, they sat, and they worked with, and they tried to bring healing to the sick and the dying, whether they were Jew or Roman. These Christians didn't leave babies to die. In that, in that culture, children were oftentimes, little infants were oftentimes left out on the side of the road to die from exposure if they were sick or deformed or female. But these new Christians, with this new way that they were called to live in this upside-down kingdom, began rescuing these babies, bringing them into their homes, raising them up. These new Christians saw the worth of every single individual, the dignity of every human life. They, they welcomed and came alongside of the slave, bringing dignity, respect, and honor to them. It was the worth of every single soul, the dignity of every life, and it became contagious. And only God's kingdom can do that. The Roman Empire couldn't do it. And the Republican Party and the Democratic Party can't do it. And this culturally disruptive love, this eternal focus built on a solid foundation of Jesus, shocked the world. And it still does when we get glimmers of it. These new Christians who were stuck between the Jewish temple and the Roman Empire, both of them wanting to destroy them, and yet the Jewish temple is no more, and the Roman Empire is no more, and the Babylonian and the Persian Empire are no more, and one day the Republican Party and the Democratic Party will be no more. But Jesus said, on my church I will build my kingdom, and the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. And the church is still standing. And God's kingdom is still advancing. How does this happen? Not because of a grab for power, but by how they loved. This is the upside down kingdom of Jesus. And if we're a follower of Jesus, this way of love is still the way forward. You know, these early followers of Jesus, they pledged allegiance to this disruptive, upside-down kingdom. They embraced the mission of Jesus, bringing his love and hope to the world. And the kingdom of Jesus is still the way forward. As followers of Jesus, we must always, always, always choose kingdom over party or platform. We must put our Jesus filter in front of our political filter. We must love as Jesus loved. It's how we can experience hope and joy and peace in this cultural chaos It's how the world will know who Jesus is. And a handful of ragtag followers of Jesus some 2,000 years ago did just that. And it changed the world. So, I want to give you a couple quick next steps as you get ready to vote this Tuesday. This week, as we live as citizens in Jesus' upside-down kingdom, don't lose your mind, right? Whatever happens on Tuesday, don't lose your mind. 
Jesus is still king. He's still on the throne. His kingdom is still advancing. He is our hope. He is our salvation. Secondly, we're called to live with an eternal focus. We're called to live with an eternal focus, not an earthly focus. We're focused on him and his eternity that's in front of us. We are citizens of heaven. And then third, we love like Jesus loved. We love like Jesus loved. It's how people will see Jesus. And how you respond this week on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday can do more for the cause of Christ than you could ever imagine. So let's love as Jesus loved. Go. Vote. Vote your Jesus-centered, biblically informed conscience. Vote. But let's love like Jesus loved. Let's live in this upside-down kingdom how he's called us to live because it is the way forward and our hope is in him and he is still on the throne. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would help us to live in this place that is not our true home and not where our real citizenship is. God, that we would have our eyes towards eternity, but that in these moments, as we live in this place, that we would honor you, that we would live your ways, that we would love as you loved, and that the world would see you by how we live and respond. So God, would you help us to do that in a week that will be incredibly challenging? May we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today for Church Online. You know, we have services at 8.30, 9.45, and 11 a.m. We'd love to see you in person anytime next week, week number two of our series, Upside Down Kingdom. Until then, God bless. Hi, Grace River. My name's Jen Hecht, and on behalf of Grace River Leadership, I want to thank you for being a generous church. People give in several ways. They give spontaneously as needs arise, or they give during a church service as they feel God leading them. But the Bible says in Isaiah 32, 8, that generous people plan to be generous. With summer plans and summer vacations, the average church experiences a dip in their giving, but Grace River isn't the average church. If you value the ministry of Grace River, why not plan to be generous? If generosity is important to you, why not make it automatic? Why not do what the Bible says and plan to give? Here's how easy it is. Go to graceriver.cc forward slash give, then click the button that says give now. Follow the on-screen prompts to set up your reoccurring giving. This is how me and my family do it, and we want to encourage you to do the same. Set it up once and let technology manage it for you. Again, I want to thank you for being a generous church. Let's beat the summer dip.